an enor tad ar mab ar asprit glan in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome once again to our third Advent devotion. And I shall begin with the Church in Wales Advent prayer, firstly in Welsh, then in English. With you. Dard Neville, a roitun a liney, a can vowid mein bead or drachlod. Daro de yachad, ir rising glav. De nerth, ir rising diovev. De dosteri, ir rising galari. Ath the werder, ir rising guaithio, er yachai, a guasenaithi arach. Bendithia genedel a cumri, ac usprid, o hail de gariad. A chaniata in need de dragarid, a that gidioid a mercen Christ de Vab. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the midst of a troubled world, you are light and life. Send us your healing for those who are ill, your strength for those who are suffering, your compassion for those who grieve, and your courage for those who work for the healing and service of others. Bless our nation of Wales with the life-giving spirit of your love and grant us your mercy revealed in the person of Christ your Son. Amen. And now a reading from the Gospel according to St Mark, chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed... The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Well, one of the many consequences of the pandemic has been, hasn't it, that we've not been able to pop around to the homes of friends or family, unless of course they're part of our bubble. As a priest, visiting people in their homes is a key part of the job. To comfort someone after a bereavement, to see someone who's been unwell, to give a housebound person Holy Communion, or just to have a chat. Uh, All of this, of course, has been forbidden, making my work much more complicated. But just as an ordinary person, 
I hesitate, by the way, to say normal person. Just as an ordinary person, uh, going to someone's house for a cuppa, for a meal, a drink or a party is a lovely thing to do. Now, it's also good if, like me, you're a bit of a nosy parker. Like that TV programme Through the Keyhole, I love to see inside other people's homes. Not least because you can get ideas for decor or furniture uh, for your own place. Uh, just having said that, I've suddenly thought none of you will invite me round anymore because you'll think I'm having a little nose at everything in your house. Now, of course, what you realise when you visit people's homes is that some people prefer old things, don't they? Um, things like Persian rugs, antique tables and chairs and clocks and sideboards and so on. Other people go for a modern look in their home, all sleek lines and metallic finishes. Now, of course, there's a lot to be said for either look and both can be equally attractive. And I guess until things go back to normal, whenever that will be, I'll have to be content with uh, trying to peer over people's shoulders on those ever-present Zoom calls. Now, the distinction between the old and the new, I think, can be seen in the person of John the Baptist, who we consider in this third week of Advent. First, though, we might ponder why it is that John is such an important figure in Advent. After all, he doesn't actually have much to do, when you think about it, uh, with the birth of Jesus, which of course we're looking forward to in whatever I said it was, 11 days time. Apart from in Luke's Gospel, of course, where we're told that John was conceived six months before Jesus, and we're also told that Mary went to visit John's mother Elizabeth when Mary found out that she was going to become the mother of Jesus. But the greatest focus on John, of course, is when he and Jesus are both adults and Jesus is about to start his public ministry, as we heard in that passage from Mark. But of course, what we need to understand is the full meaning of the Advent season, because it's about so much more than looking ahead to the birth of Jesus at Christmas. Advent means coming, that's what the word means. And so we think about Jesus' coming in many different ways. Yes, his coming into the world as a baby, uh, but also his second coming at the end of time, his coming into our hearts, and his coming onto the public stage, if you like, at the age of about 30. John is seen as preparing the people for the start of Jesus's public ministry through his own preaching and so it should be obvious then that he is a key part of Advent. But back to John as this figure who brings together the old and the new. Now you might naturally think that John is a New Testament figure after all, this is where he's mentioned. He's introduced at the very start of the Gospels of John, of Mark and of Luke, and in the third chapter of Matthew. So John the Baptist is clearly part of God's plan to do something new and dramatic. The similarities between his conception and that of Jesus, which Luke talks about, tell us this. And then as an adult, John builds up a strong following through his preaching and through his practice of baptising people in the River Jordan as a way of them signifying their repentance and their turning back to God. He announces that Jesus is coming with these words, as recorded in Luke's Gospel, I baptise you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. Is that word? Coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And John then comes face to face with Jesus and indeed baptises him. 
But after that, uh, we don't actually hear very much about John in the Gospels until the accounts of his beheading in Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 9. So undeniably, then, John is a New Testament figure. But there's also a sense in which he is from the world of the Old Testament as well. With his fiery preaching and his unusual solitary existence, John is very much in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets, who we considered last week, of course. And in fact, John is um, often regarded as the last in the line of the Old Testament prophets. He's frequently compared to Elijah, the great prophet of Israel, who lived almost 900 years before the time of Jesus. Now, Jewish belief held that Elijah would one day return to the earth to herald the coming of the Messiah. Uh, we see that referred to, for example, in the Old Testament book of Malachi. And to this day, Jewish people actually keep an empty seat at the Passover meal. Whenever they celebrate the Passover, there's always an empty seat there ready and waiting for Elijah, for whenever he will, in fact, return. And Jesus makes that connection between John and Elijah explicit. When he says, for example, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 to 14, Jesus says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. And even actually John's clothing underlines this connection between him and Elijah. The Gospels tell us that John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And in the first book of Kings, chapter one in the Old Testament, Elijah is described as, and I quote, a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. Now, some have speculated that Elijah's coat and belt had been handed down over the centuries and came into the possession of Zechariah, John's father. And knowing that his son would have a special role to fulfill, he then uh, gave them to John. It's a nice story, not sure whether it's true or not, who knows. So John then straddles, if you like, two worlds. He is from the era of the Old Testament, but he heralds the beginning of the era of the New Testament by preparing the way for Jesus the Messiah, the one who actually establishes that new era. And Jesus himself recognises this position that John has when he says this in Luke chapter 16, verse 16. Jesus says, the law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed. And that term, the law and the prophets, is a Jewish term for what we Christians call the Old Testament. It's John then, seemingly, who marks the turning point, the turning point between the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, and the good news of the kingdom, the New Testament. And John himself recognises that his ministry isn't an end in itself. Rather, it prepares the ground for and points to something else which comes next. This is shown in his comments, which I quoted earlier. One who is more powerful than I is coming. And also in John's Gospel, there's an interesting uh, little story in chapter three of that gospel. John the Baptist's followers come to him and it seems almost as though they're complaining that everyone is now following Jesus instead of John. And John simply replies, he must increase, I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. 
this really shows, doesn't it, his awareness of his place in God's scheme of things, but also a great humility, really, and lack of ego. John wasn't doing what he was doing for his own glory or status, but only in order to draw people to the Messiah and so help herald this new era. Now, this might all be very interesting, uh, but it's not just of purely academic interest. Because if you think about it, this whole season of Advent that we've been exploring in these weeks straddles the two eras. Our first theme, uh, wasn't it, was the patriarchs and matriarchs stretching right back virtually to the beginning of the Old Testament story. We saw there how God began his personal relationship with Abraham and Sarah and their descendants. And he promised to them that their family would give rise to a mighty nation. Then last week we saw how the prophets of the Old Testament, aware of the mess that humans had made of the world, declared that God would one day send his Messiah, born as a human, to bring hope and salvation. So our first two weeks were very much Old Testament. And Advent then, indeed our whole faith, embraces the sweep of history, looking back into past centuries and forward into eternity. And then this week, of course, we have John, the pivot point, if you like, between old and new. And next week, our fourth Advent theme, it will be Mary, very much a New Testament figure, the one who brings Jesus into the world. So we have that sweep throughout these weeks of Advent. Now, I began by commenting on how some people uh, prefer old things in their homes, while other people prefer the new. In reality, our faith and the life of the church, there can be no such distinction between old and new. Because Christianity has been around for so many centuries, there's an awful lot of tradition and an awful lot of history. It's important that we learn from the past and honour it. But at the same time, we can't be constrained by it either. We must recognise that our God is a God of surprises. He is constantly doing new things and leading us in new directions. We must have the courage to follow wherever he leads, knowing that he travels with us, so that we might continue to spread his good news in the world. And while we're at it, let us remember those deeply humble words of John. He must increase, but I must decrease. It's never about us. It's always about Jesus. In everything that we do, we shouldn't seek glory or recognition for ourselves or even for the church, but simply point people towards the Messiah and Saviour of all. Amen. Gwedhiwn, let us pray. Blessed are you, Sovereign Lord, just and true, to you be praise and glory for ever. Your prophet, John the Baptist, was witness to the truth as a burning and shining light. May we, your servants, rejoice in his light, and so be led to witness to him, who is the Lord of our coming kingdom, Jesus our Saviour and King of the ages. Blessed be God for ever. Amen. People of God, return. You are called to be God's own. From the mountains announce the good news. God comes in justice and peace to all who follow his ways. You are God's children. Lord, make us one in the peace of Christ, today and forever.
Amen. The Collect for the First Sunday of Advent. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Ein tad ur honot yn y nefoedd, sanctaidio'r dy enw deled dy dernas, gwynelad y ewyllus, megis yn y nef felliar y ddau o'r hefyd, dy rywun i heddiw ein barod boenyddio, a maddau i ni ein dyledion, fel y maddau yn ninau un dyledwyr, ac nac arwain ni i brofedigaeth, aeth o'r gwared ni rhag drwg, canesau dy ti o'r dernas, a'r galli ar gogoniant yn oes oesoedd. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you, now and for evermore. Amen. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. It's lovely to have had your company on this third Monday in Advent as we've explored the life and witness and work of St John the Baptist. Hope that it's given you something to think about, something to ponder upon uh, through his life and things we can take away from tonight and keep with us through the rest of this journey through Advent. So thank you once again uh, for being with me and we shall conclude our little series same time next Monday, six o'clock, when we'll be looking at the Blessed Virgin Mary. Until then, keep well, keep safe. Nostar.